2020 and COVID-19 certainly raised many questions about exit exams and credentials. Our colleagues in the Northern Hemisphere would know only too well that for various reasons, the final exams in many countries had to be cancelled and alternative strategies found. What new normal might emerge from this or not, we will soon find out. In Australia, with some adjustments, the examination systems across the country were largely maintained. We were fortunate that our year follows a different uh, cycle. But should those exams be maintained? That's the question today. Can I now call on Tony to lead us deep into that territory? Thank you, uh, Phil, and thank you, Jeff. Uh, it's great to be with you, colleagues, and uh, the tone has been set. This promises to be a, a lively exchange uh, of ideas because we have three very significant leaders uh, in education who each are passionate about uh, this area. And I'm going to say a word just to briefly introduce but not take time from the debate but just to position each of you. And as I introduce you, I'm going to ask you how would you have preferred to have been introduced uh, immediately after what I say. Um, and then before we get started, uh, we're going to ask you all to vote on the question at hand. And that will be um, a pre-poll to the exchange, and then there'll be a post-poll. And we'll let you know what the correct answer is before you vote again uh, at the end of the session. But um, let me say that you've received information, so I'm not going to spend time with long biographical details, but uh, Tom, fantastic to have you with us. Um, of course, now at the University of Sydney, uh, chairing a very important centre on uh, educational measurement and assessment, but a history in this state and nationally. Uh, that means that you bring to tonight's debating topic and I'm using the word debate pretty loosely here, uh, colleagues, uh, a wealth of experience and not without an opinion or two. In fact, I just want to use one quote for each of the uh, uh, presenters tonight just to give you a little bit of an advance on what their position is likely to be. This one, I have to say, I think is almost unmatched. But Greg and Sandra, I'll get to you in a moment. HSC is a glittering asset and we must protect it. Uh, now, I, I don't know whether that actually, Tom, means that you've declared your position. Not yet. <laughs> okay. And if you had another note that would help people to understand where you're coming from, what would you add to my less than adequate introduction? Uh, nothing in particular. Uh, I'm happy if people are talking about me, Tony. I don't care what saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, Greg... Uh, let me welcome you and say that as Executive Director, Catholic Education, um, obviously the Diocese of Parramatta, um, you are also not without uh, a profile in uh, matters to do with education, uh, author, uh, advocate, uh, both on uh, this stage uh, here um, in this country, but also internationally. So um, let me read yours, uh, Greg, just to give you a flavour of what I think you should say, these are clear prompts to make sure that we do get a debate. The world has moved on, but how we measure student achievement is stuck in the past. Uh, is that a position, Greg? That's a position. Okay. And I think it's getting worse each day. <laughs> do you want to add? And my message to everyone, sleep is wake. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me this, if you wanted to try and help people to understand even more where you're coming from. Is there some interesting fact about you that you'd like to share? <laughs> I'm just a fellow pilgrim. Uh, a fellow pilgrim. I'll tell you what, the level of humility, yeah? Sandra, you're going to have to help us uh, just to lift, I think, the sense of confidence here. Uh, Professor Sandra Milligan, uh, people will know that you are an uh, enterprise professor at the, and director of the Assessment Research Centre at the University of Melbourne. And... I would have thought, actually, Sandra, that you must feel that these kinds of gatherings are now becoming a feature of your life, if not every day, certainly every week, uh, because you're doing this both uh, across the country and, again, uh, internationally. And here's your quote. 
is slightly a variation. I've taken a bit of license here. Sandra, I hope you recognise it, right? I've said the dominant end of school credentials are typically silent about a type of learning that is highly valued by students and teachers. Um, so Sandra, welcome. Uh, would you have chosen a different quote and would you like to say something that will help people understand where you're coming from? Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, the first thing I'd say is that I am an assessment lover and I think that assessment and measurement can rule the world and solve all the world's problems if it's allowed. So that's sort of uh, my general position. The other part is I'm feeling jealous about um, Greg's socks. Yeah. Um, the, the way the camera is positioned for me, um, the socks are quite prominent and I love them. So I'm not as flamboyant as Greg, um, but there you go. <laughs> They're terrific. Um, Fantastic. And any, any interesting fact about interesting. that you want to share just so people know who you are? Um, okay, so 30 years in trying to shift the assessment system to assess things properly and assess the things that count. So that's what I'd say. That's where I'm coming from. I sort of feel as though I'm going to agree with Greg, but I suspect also that I'll share some ideas with Tom as well. So maybe I'll be the, the centre, the meat in the sandwich perhaps. <laughs> that is brilliant. Well, look, it's fantastic that we are able to establish the seriousness of this exchange. Um, but, Greg, I do want to say that I think I'm going to send a note to Parsi Solberg that actually his sneakers are not up to your socks. So uh, I've got a matching pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are, colleagues. The vote is about to be taken. I'm going to read the question. It's quite complex, and the response, you have to concentrate, okay? It can either be yes or no or undecided. If you can hold those three possible responses in your head, yeah, and then we're going to put the poll question up. Um, Helen, I'm assuming that we're going to put the poll question up on the screen or it'll come. And the question is, and this is for all of us, those in the room and those who are spread across the country, uh, the question is, have senior secondary high stakes examinations outlived their purpose? I'll repeat it. Have senior secondary high stakes examinations outlived their purpose? Now, I need to know whether or not the poll is open. It is open. So could you please now vote yes, no, or undecided? And I think you've got the capacity to do that because you've been sent information so that you can lodge your vote. Now, Helen, tell me when you want me to close the vote. Right, done. Have you managed to get on? No. That will make things difficult. Um, okay, so... Yes. Well, I'll tell you what then, we better do a straw vote in the room if we haven't been able to pick up voting here. The question is whether we've picked up voting online, but I'm not going to delay. Uh, we'll do a straw vote. Um, well, no, we'll do a real vote. <laughs> we'll do a real vote in the room. So those who are responding to the question, have senior secondary high stakes examinations outlived their purpose? In the affirmative, can you please raise your hand? Just get me a... a Good, I'm getting a bit of an impression. Thank you, we know who you are. Uh, this is anonymous, of course. Uh, <laughs> and those who would vote um, no, they have not outlived their purpose. That is slightly in the ascendancy. And those who are undecided. Okay, at this point in time, can I make it clear that uh, the, the majority in this room are saying uh, in the negative that senior secondary high stakes examinations have not outlived their purpose. Okay, here we go. Uh, we'll see where we stand at the end of tonight. Colleagues, there's a set of rules which we just are going to share with you now. We didn't want you to know in advance. Uh, we wanted to keep it uh, as spontaneous as possible. The rules are 
Each of you have 10 minutes. Um, you may have thought you had longer, uh, but unfortunately you don't. And please forgive what might appear to be discourtesy because at the eight minute mark, I'm going to tell you, you've got two minutes left. After each of you has spoken, and the sequence is Tom, uh, Greg, uh, and then Sandra, I'm going to go back around each of you and say, since you've now heard your fellow debaters and their positions, do you want to respond briefly around a couple of issues that you'd like to address again, or some issues you want to set up for what will then become an open discussion here? And I might say, when we get to questions and comments, Helen's going to be monitoring the chat for all of you who are uh, tuning in via our Zoom link. So we'll try and do as well as we can to represent questions and comments that are coming through from the wider community. So uh, when you come back, can I just make it clear, your second time around is only going to be two to three minutes. So it has to be sharp. So with that, Tom, um, launch us into this debate. All right. Thanks, Tony. Let me know where I'm at five as well. Can you do that? I'll do that. Because I had prepared very carefully calculated words for exactly 19 minutes, so I'm truncating as I go. Right. Three quick points. Take it for granted, of course, that I'm not in when I'm lodged criticism, type, talking about either Sandra or uh, Greg. And secondly, I've organised myself around the debating point only very generally because there are some things I want to say. Okay, so let's begin by clarifying the issue at hand. The HSC and equivalents are primarily courses of study. They're not long run-ups to an assessment. They're courses of study that are assessed at the end and reported for a variety of purposes. And that's important to recognise that the heart of it is the learning. So let's go to those purposes. The first person, uh, purpose, as I say, is the learning itself. The HSC and other equivalents around the country are an enormously rich and varied curriculum. I won't, even if I had time, go through the nature of uh, and the variety of that learning and the opportunities to learn, but there are opportunities to learn in abstracted ways, practical ways, constructivist pedagogy, instruction, self-guidance, etc. Another purpose is recognition of achievement. Outstanding achievement in learning proclaims individual capacity and effort. As educators, we cultivate capacity and we celebrate it. It's in achievement, in achievement and its recognition that we provide opportunity for individuals notwithstanding their background. Our ambition is to recognise absolute and relative achievement. The credential allows that recognition to go beyond justified personal gratification. Ironically, Recognising outstanding achievement is sometimes downplayed by educators in a sort of, I would say, wrong-headed, egalitarian posture, which should not fall into the trap of understating the value of merit. A meritocratic education system is the bedrock of democracy and of inclusivity and of equity. Good credentials, I don't want to have to repeat this, good credentials do not achieve equity. They are a prerequisite for it. It will be argued that the level of competition is unnecessary and counterproductive. I can't disagree. It is, however, a function of processes which are broader than the credential. It's about the application of credential and uh, uh, contemporary culture. The ATAR, of course, is an issue at hand. It is not the credential. The ATAR is owned and run by universities, the same universities that often complain about it. No one has to have an ATAR. In New South Wales, 75% of kids apply for it. In other states, it's a lot, a lot lower than that. While it has uh, 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 distorting effects, the, the competition for ATAR has a distorting effect, I would argue that we do not distort and compromise the educational values upon which the curriculum and the assessment of that curriculum are independently based in order to engineer an ATAR effect. Of course, kids uh, compete for ATARs and there's complicated, uh, complicated issues there. The, the entry into university is enormously fraught. I'll leave that part out. Another purpose of credentialing is, of course, to present in a form much of what students have achieved in their schooling. 
for employment purposes, uh, for example. Outcomes including, uh, best outcomes are included in the HSC, life skills standards are included, etc. It's worth noting that people are of the view uh, that the, H the focus on academic aspects of the HSC and the disproportionate attention that is paid there makes the vocational purposes of the reporting of HSC curriculum assessment pretty opaque to employers. I think that may be true, uh, but let me be clear about this. Employment purposes of school education are very fraught, direct employment. Don't let anyone tell you that employers have some sort of unitary or coherent position on what they want. It's not only different in different industries and for different jobs, but employers change their expectations depending on the state of the employment market. What they mean by literacy very often is very job specific, and you might think it might be a responsibility of them to achieve. So overall, when we're considering purpose, it's complex. I'm of the view, and we'll return to this, that the purposes are still valid when you focus on the fact that our purpose is really is about education, it's about learning, and it's about recognition in the achievement of learning. Everything else must be judged against that ambition. New technologies and social upheaval do not undermine our, uh, our responsibilities in that, in that regard. Five minutes. There are a few criticisms that are made of the HSC, and I'm happy to take them on. Firstly, it is said that, uh, that the external aspect doesn't trust teachers. This implies local judgment. Let's be clear that teacher judgment is the bedrock of professional practice and standing. The external aspect of this practice is extremely valued. Why? Because moderating your judgment against the fullness of the profession is in fact at the heart of the definition of a profession. That another professional, having regard to the same evidence against the same criteria, will likely come to the same conclusion is, the, is inherent in the purpose of being a professional. The isolated judgments, valuable and as they may be, do not constitute professional judgment. It has to be shared. We're also told the curriculum is not 21st century. I'm not quite sure what that means. 21st century, does it mean the disciplines are no longer valid? It may mean that. Does it mean the disciplines at their edges are dissipated? I think they may be. But do we have alternative learning frameworks that have been validated for the heavy responsibility they carry to be part of the school curriculum. Let's take, for example, uh, approaches to this that have been tried previously or exist currently. The Victorian Essential Learning Standards in Victoria are categories that recognise that some cognitive capacities go beyond existing learning domains or recognised learning domains. The general capabilities in the uh, uh, national curriculum are that as well. What we know is this you can be assured that you cannot take for granted that the existence of alternative ways of learning have been validated for the purposes for which they are proposed. The VELs and most of the National Curriculum General Capabilities are not reliably accessible, not until they are more specified. And then they're no longer general. There's no lack of history in this. The My Key Competencies, you'll remember, they were included in secondary curriculum in New South Wales because they were an expression, we were told, at the time of the future. We blithely ignored the research that said that these competencies were not transferable and we spent zillions on them. I personally had a couple of jobs as a result of it, um, but they're gone. They're gone because they weren't adequately uh, uh, defined. In the end, 21st century learning is an empty signifier of progressive intent, a heading that implies that there's something else out there that we should be doing. I'm going to try to buttress my case by saying, of course, and in the time available, of course there are things I would change. Firstly, there is a domain of learning and of individual capacity that is not captured fully or completely within the organisation of learning, which has either a practical or academic basis it is now. So these are individual citizenship capacities, people's contributions, that of course that, that can be organised in a, in a dynamic way around individuals, that can be portable, that could in fact outlast the credential. 
you don't need to undermine the value of the asset and the credential to achieve that. Personally, six or seven years ago, I undertook such a project to try and trial it with secondary principles, employers, UAC, etc. It fell to the side because of lack of uh, resources. And you have two minutes. Secondly, I would recognise that the ATAR needs substantial reform. Uh, it uh, it shouldn't be a single measure. It should be possibly a, a number of measures. But also, the, in New South Wales, HSC, 10 units should not be used to calculate the ATAR. You could do it with six or eight units. It's just as reliable. That would free up watch, uh, learning, watch uh, um, the, the languages and practical subjects uh, uh, grow. I want to really emphasise these points. Firstly, the point of education in the senior years is not instrumentalist for employment purposes or for university purposes. We need to understand those expectations, but it's about the learning. Secondly, abandoning shared standards and assessment against those standards is a disaster for both professional practice and equity. Third, thirdly, we don't need to do it, whatever it is, just because it's possible to do it. There's a long history of us taking on reform because we think it might work and the price is borne by teachers and students. And finally, this is not a culture war. It's a professional responsibility which tests our collective responsibility. I've been an activist. I've been a policymaker. They are different responsibilities. For policymakers and for the profession generally, consultation, genuine research and consideration are values we are ourselves and the profession. Tom, thank you. So third. Now, by the way, Greg, as you take up uh, the debate, um, we'll determine whether or not the applause that you receive at the end is louder than the applause that we heard for Tom. I just wanted to put people on notice. Do you, you want to have a, another opportunity to applaud Tom? Just so, yeah, can I, yeah, I, I, so I to be clear, yeah. Uh, I want you to know I'm a fair moderator here. Uh, uh, Greg, over to you. Oh, thank you. I, I was, thought I was third, but anyway, I'm happy to move up the batting order. Um, I too want to acknowledge the lands, the traditional lands of the, uh, that we gather on today and pay my respects to elders past and present for their great stewardship of this wonderful great south land of ours. I don't know any other thing that could get so many eminent people in this room. <laughs> so in that sense, I think Tom has been a success. But um, uh, I'm very privileged and very glad that you've taken the time and you think the issue that started with a simple exchange between Tom and, Tom and myself and we've known each other for quite a long time. Uh, it's escalated into this, but it actually has its roots in a whole range of different things. So thanks very much. I had a pre-run of this last week with uh, David DiCavallo in another forum, so I was able to sort of polish um, uh, some of the things up that I wanted to say. Um, so let's uh, strangle the chicken and look at the entrails and uh, see what we can go. Um, look, <laughs> let's get straight to the point. Um, the HSC is an obsolete credential that has a deleterious effect on student learning, well-being and for a whole we're entrenching, continually entrenched disadvantage. There are, of course, a whole range of subsets of, of that you can take. And I do want to acknowledge that, since Tom's mentioned his role as policymaker and activist, that I understand, I am a political realist, I understand that um, you know, politics and ideology are always at play here, and um, I'm not going to make any comment on those in any detail, but it is a reality that we have to deal with when, when we do the work that we do, and I echo the sense, the sentiments about the importance of the profession. Um, let me start with a, 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 a not too short a quote, but this is from a Hansard. The government finds itself in the same position as the manufacturer who is endeavoring, endeavoring to handle a rapidly expanding undertaking in obsolete premises. There comes a time when the businessman must decide whether he will continue to patch up the old buildings or build a new, uh, new factory. The school system is already undergoing natural expansion far beyond anything it will experience because of the impact of uh, the new proposals. Delay in bringing it into line with contemporary thought will only make the inevitable modernisation more expensive when it does come. 
and come it must if our children are to be properly prepared to handle the affairs of the 21st century. Any other want to guess who said that? Well, I'll tell you who said that. It came from the Hansard, um, from the uh, um, from the Attorney General Reg Downing in 1961, speaking about the Wyndham Report. Like, let's go back to Peter Board in the 1910, 11, whatever, Parkinson Keys, then we come to the the, the metal one, and we've got here. What have we got? More of the same. We can argue at the extremes. I mean, I spent for 10 years on the Australian history syllabus. It took five years to to and get agreement that you could have an Australian history syllabus, um, and it was implemented and lasted for three years because it was developed in themes and it was subject to the policy and culture issue, culture wars, and eventually an incoming um, conservative government took it away. That is a microcosm of what's happening there and, and what's valued. The issues are not what Tom said. The issues are what is valued and what is not valued. And the issue is where you find the answers. You don't find them as 1961, you think as a group of professionals we could get our act together and our politicians get back together and rethink this. The quote you've just heard sounds almost contemporary, uh, yet actually it comes from that parliamentary discussion that I've outlined. Um, and you may be shocked to learn that I don't actually today care about the Hatches Sea exam um, per se. It's an artefact. It's an artefact of the way we've tried to think about how we can um, teach our kids to do whatever we value and, and whatever we hope that we can do. So it's not the HSC, of course, it's the infrastructure behind it. And it's not just the curriculum and the, whether they're key learning areas. We've tried them all. But what grows from that is the actual structure of delivery. So we are still operating in a factory model where one size fits all and we squeeze and we push and blah, yada, yada, yada. So I want to really argue about obsolescence, learning, and the last one is equity. That's how I want to focus the discussion because I don't disagree in the construct that Tom put that you can do all that and the ATAR can do all that and that sort of thing. But there's a bigger question whether that's doing what we want to do. Um, and I've talk, talked about it being, um, you know, at least 60 years or so. I think it's about time that we face some of the real challenges. So it's obsolete. For the younger members of our audience, I want to put you in some perspective. In 1961, blue collar jobs of life were the norm. Officers had tea trolleys. Smoking at your desk was encouraged. And some women still got sacked for getting married. There's probably some people who'd like to revert to those times. So much of the way we work, live and learn has changed. And I know that Tom has alluded to that, but COVID-19 has accelerated the pace. But it's demonstrated how connected we are and the need for a radical rethink. And we've tried new things and tried new ways of both the delivery and how we, um, how we provide information to parents about kids' um, achievement and, and assessment. We seem to have been able to squeeze assessment around to fit the, the term that nobody's at school. Five minutes. Um, I don't think there's a, a, you know, a political statement, but you know, we need some courage in government to, to rethink this addiction to high-stake testing. And, um, and it's no cause for celebration that we don't. The HSC is that industrial model and it belongs to a long area and I don't, and I don't think business as usual is good enough. Um, if you doubt this, just listen to you know, the words of um, uh, Jennifer Westacott who said what they're looking for in, in talking about employers uh, is more than just a qualification. And that brings up and I, I break, cracks, over, cracks over a whole range of possibilities in schools. Um, <clears throat> Not only is the HSC disconnected from the way we live and work now, it's not too crash hot in looking after student wellbeing. The HSC is often a showstopper for families from which families don't even eventually fully recover. It's not uncommon for some parents to take significant amounts of work, time off work to support their kids and get through the HSC. Such is the pressure that is placed on these young people. Everyone walks around on eggshells for months there's stress management techniques beforehand, and a whole industry has grown in the restorative post-exam break called schoolies. 
And if you're doing the whole thing once, well, that wasn't bad. We also throw in a trials too. So let's be honest here. Um, learning the age, from the HSC and the subject stops at a particular time, probably at the end of July, why we now go into these practices. So we're not only doing one HSC, we're doing two, just so that they can learn how to do the HSC. What's that say to you about how we deal with this issue of assessment? Uh, seriously, though, high stakes testing impacts negatively, I think, on the well-being of young people. And uh, a recent New South Wales University School of Education survey of Year 12 students found that, um, and the range of schools in Sydney found that 42% registered, registered high levels of anxiety uh, symptoms and um, high enough for clinical concern. The extreme stress associated with these exams is enough of a problem that the health NGO Reach Out has run suicide prevention campaigns and lead up to the HSC. Your marks do not define you. Amen to that. And I'm not catastrophizing this. I'm using some of the broad examples. We can dig deeper if time. Um, let's turn now to the deleterious effect of the HSC on student learning. Uh, Sandra Milligan has spoken powerfully about the live activities, the alternatives to high stage testing and the HSC as a credential. There are many and uh, other better ways, and we're seeing them emerge with micro credentialing and greater involvement in partnerships more porous boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't need to te tell you about teaching to the test that we've all done it at some times. Now it's an opportunity um, for those who have one to make use of very good memory in this process. It's an open secret. It's, it's an open secret that some schools even game the HSC uh, in selection of subjects and those sorts of things. High stakes testing has also spawned a billion dollar tutoring industry, which owes access to preying on aspirations of parents and children for fear of missing out. Each year, young people sit in rows of desks after school weekends, doing school holidays, churning through sample papers, et cetera, et cetera. To be very clear, there is nothing wrong with specialised one-to-one -one support for students to help uh, with their learning, but it's not what we're seeing here. Uh, the final one I want to have is the most important one as I look at the entrails of the chicken, bring me to this most important point. It's the point of equity. Literacy, numeracy, math, et cetera, are critically important to our future. But at the expense of increasing the divide, it's not worth it. Um, rather than sifting and sorting out the slackers, the HSC sorts the haves from the have nots. The SES data on high-performing schools from all sectors, including the selectives, demonstrates the HSC is biased towards the well-to-do. Uh, and I make you all uncomfortable a little bit. You probably all remember this, but I remind you about the, uh, the headline um, in, in 1996 about Mount Druitt, splashed across the front page, the class who failed. Did irreputable damage, not only to that school, but to Western Sydney in my patch. This cohort of young people, who no doubt deserve congratulations for our community on completing their studies, were ridiculed on the front page of the paper. We said we'd never do it again, but every year since, failure is the subtext of every HSC result lift down. And what's the exception with ranking students? Surely schooling is not a winner-takes-all endeavour. Perhaps Sportsbet could just step in and run a book on it. No doubt we'd know that James Roos would be on un unbackable odds, and I'm not having a shot at James Roos. The Wyndham, uh, Wyndham, I think Wyndham was ahead of his time. He was bold, he was daring, uh, spent a good amount of time, reminds me very much of what we've gone through with uh, Jeff Masters. Um, and we are well behind our, uh, him in our thinking in 2021. Maintaining an HSC for, for as long as we have is not only a, um, a cause of great concern for a profession, but it's a singular lack of our imagination to be able to dream a different way of doing things. And finally, I want to leave um, the last words to Martin Luther King uh, in a different context, of course, but talking before he was assassinated in 1987. He called it the fierce urgency of the now. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of the now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. 
This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action because no child should be left behind. Thank you, Greg. Could it indicate the response? Thank you very much. Um, Sandra, I'm coming to you and I'll extend you the same uh, courtesy of a five minute and a final two minutes. Over to you. Okay, thanks, Tony. Um, just a note that I'm coming to you all today from the lands of the Ghana people in South Australia. So, um, my respects to the, to the lands here. Um, Tony, I think I'm going to, just to make things interesting, try and have a bob each way. So I've listened to Tom and I've listened to Greg and this is what I want to say. Um, yes and no, high stakes examinations have and have not outlived their usefulness. I definitely think They've outlived their usefulness if we're depending on them to tell us what kids know and what they can do or the degree to which we know that about the things we value. So how's that? That sounds pretty sweeping. They've outlived their usefulness for that. However, I don't think they've yet outlived their usefulness in providing a trust underpinning to our recognition system and a sort of sense of equity in it. Now, I want to explain that because some people will probably find that a bit puzzling. And, and this is where I come from. You know, I talk to a lot of principals. And if you say to a principal, what are your learning ambitions for your kids these days? You know, has it changed over the last 20 years? And they'll say, heavens, yes, it has changed. And they'll then go and explain their school's vision for what their ambitions are for their kids. And they'll say, well, sure, I want them to be literate and numerate. And they'll probably say, and I want them to have digital literacy as well. I want them to have mastery in the disciplines, the maths, the science and the history. But they'll then go on and they'll say, but I also want them to have these, let's call them general capabilities, like um, citizenship, like contribution to the community, like being able to work in an intercultural um, environment. I want them to be able to communicate and collaborate. Some, some schools may even put a spiritual dimension on that as well. And um, when principals talk about that, they're talking on behalf of their parents as well and on behalf of their kids, that these are the sort of the learning ambitions we now have. Now, in case, you know, I'm looking, maybe Tom's getting uncomfortable here, I'm not sure, but in case you think that um, this is teachers uh, being idealistic or whatever, just have a look at some of the documentation from our leaders, our ministers of education in the Alice Springs Convention, for instance, they're saying exactly the same things. They're saying schools have got a big purpose in, in the community and we want that, that um, big purpose and that range of purposes expressed. Employers, funnily enough, are not saying a different thing. They're saying we want people who can communicate, who can think critically, who can manage new things, who, don't, who are not compliant workers and so forth. Now, the... the so the community and kids too are saying that these are the learning ambitions that we value. Now, the main issue is, this is the main issue, examinations cannot test those things. What examinations test is, um, I'm going to borrow from Lauren Resnick here, I love this phrase. She says that what standard examinations assess is unsupported mentation. I sort of like the ring, unsupported mentation. That is um, mental activity that an individual learns how to do. And that's what we ask kids to represent in an examination. And as Greg said, this, this reinforces memorization, 
it reinforces compliance, it reinforces uh, formulate results, it works against passion in learning, following things through, depth, it, um, risk taking in learning. It, it mitigates against all of those things. Um, you know, those of you in New South Wales will remember um, it hit the headlines, I think, a couple of years ago when probably the Herald said to one young candidate, how was the exam? I think it was a history exam. I'm not sure. And the, the young candidate said, it was terrible. They didn't ask the question that I'd prepared my essay for. And, you know, I think this is one of the problems with examinations. That, that's the sort of thing you can get. Another young man I was speaking to last year in the uh, forums we rang for Learning Creates Australia, you know, said, how did you go in your examinations? And he said, oh, 85, you know, referring to his ATAR. And he said, you know, I th that's okay. But he said, you know, I know a whole lot of other things and I can do a whole lot of other things but I don't know whether those things I know and can do, I don't know if they're worth anything. I don't know if I know a lot or a little, and I don't know whether other people value that. Five minutes. And the fact of the matter is he doesn't know and we don't know either. No one knows except perhaps this young person's teacher or his parents. So um, I think... Uh, the examinations have gone past their use-by date if we're going to use them to represent what kids know and can do. They, they can't do it. Now, what I would like to see is a recognition system in Australia that can represent the full range of things we value about what a kid has learned in their 12 years of schooling that represents what they know, what they can do and who they are and report that with the same level of trust, the same level of rigour that we currently have underpinning the reporting of the unsupported mentation that kids also learn. And I haven't got anything against discipline-based learning, quite to the contrary. Now, um, I know, I know, I heard Tom's scepticism about being able to assess these things. I know it's not simple, but Tony, you and I last year were, um, had the report from Learning Creates Australia that goes through and says what needs to be true before we could have a system that was sufficiently trusted is not built purely on the, um, on the uh, pillar of trust in examinations. What would need to be true for us to have this broad representation? And um, it's not simple. We would need certainly to put um, examinations in their place. There is a place for examinations. We would need completely new approaches to assessment that can manage these complex competencies that we're now talking about. We'd need new kinds of credentials, learner profiles, things like that. We'd need new kinds of agreements between us all about how we're going to understand how we're representing kids. So, so it's not simple. Um, I am optimistic that it will come and I point to the work of people like Martin Westwell um, in the SACE board, to people like, uh, and who with his colleagues in SATAC is thinking this through. I point to people like the Shergold um, report, which has said we can do this. And I believe that the Commonwealth Department is taking that up. I point to the dozens, if not hundreds of schools who are not waiting for the authorities and are going forward in this way to produce um, learner profiles that capture the full range of assessments. My biggest fear, Tony, my biggest fear is that the officialdom 
who look after our assessment and recognition systems will leave it too late to stop the fragmentation that is currently occurring in our recognition systems in, around Australia. Kids are walking with their feet away from ATAR. Universities are walking with their feet into a, a huge array of fragmented ways of getting universities in. This will be bad for standards and it will be bad for equity. So my biggest fear is that our officialdom doesn't pick up this challenge soon enough to put to, to underpin a broader range of assessment with a proper trust system. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much, colleagues. Please indicate your appreciation. So I'm going to give each uh, of our dear colleagues, uh, I'm going to suggest two minutes to respond because then we're going to open this up and already there's a stream of contributions. Um, but the spirit of this would be to take the opportunity to pick up on any issue that you'd particularly like to address, that you've heard from your colleagues, and also if you want to put something on the table that you believe must be addressed in the way in which we tackle the Q&A and uh, opening discussion. But just as I do, can I keep in your mind an issue that emerged very early in the conversation, literally at the beginning. Um, it's a concern that some people had about a contentious assumption that's incorporated into the debate question, namely that the HSC is intended to be high stakes. It's made high stakes by the relationship to the ATAR and a culture that accepts education is a sorting mechanism for employment. What if NESA refused to provide HSC results to university admissions, to UAC? So I just want that to be uh, an issue that has arisen as people have been listening to the conversation and have been looking at the very question that we've put on the table and how we've defined our terms. So, Tom, um, a quick rejoinder, a couple of minutes. All right, I did threaten to keep the HSC results from uh, UAC once. It wasn't a pleasant week when the word got back to the minister um, when I was negotiating with it. I want to say I agree, uh, you know, within the, the bounds of what is a generalised discussion with him, Sandra said. I know the setup is that I'm option A, option B, and we go with option C that's reasonable, but as it happens, I agree with what Sandra said. I agree particularly with the fact that it's not easy to do. So when you can do it, Sandra, all strength to your arm, if I can help, I'm with you. When we can reliably, incredibly assess full a range of capacities, I'm with you. In the meantime, the assessments we have are a function of the forms and what we can form. I had here in my previously prepared notes, on the near horizon, the distinction between internal and external assessments will dissolve and the range of options for good assessment will mushroom. Financing the technological adoptions is in fact the only issue. Rest assured that the impediments of such a process are not a lack of imagination or ambition, or preparation, and then I hand it for myself, it's the money paying. That's what, it isn't that we don't know what to do, it's not that we lack imagination, it's not that we don't care about the children, it's not, in fact, that we're stuck in an industrial metaphor. The metaphor works, it just doesn't capture enough proof. It doesn't help us find solutions. It works because it's neat. It doesn't help us work out what are we going to do about the depth of learning that comes into, uh, out of the disciplines and then beyond the discipline and the industrial, the, the vet domains that we're working and languages and performances and creativity, et cetera. And how do we work out as a profession? Are we going to put in the money, that is the effort, to find out the principles, the educational principles that are perennial and go beyond the disciplines themselves and will sustain us in fact in a changing world? because they may become much more crucial, and I will argue they are. No one is opposed, I'll put my hand up, to change. I have, I have created bureaucratic structures and torn them down myself. I closed the school I attended as a student. I'm not committed to form. What I am committed to, what I ask as a profession, we take much more seriously and profoundly than we, than we do, is this. It is the educated purpose that is the test, and our 
assessment and moderation and judgment of achieving that as educated, educated person, uh, a purpose for students, the infrastructure, professional infrastructure we build around it be a common and shared one because that's in fact what makes it a professional one. Everything beyond that is form. Uh, and to use the architectural maxim of which I'm uh, fond, form follows function. It's an educated function. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'd like just to thank Jordan Baker here for her um, work in getting the, the, the details of the cost. The, the money, we can give you $100 million immediately if you don't do this and take to see. Uh, that's what it costs, according to the, the information we got. Um, a lot of money is expended. And I acknowledge that I've been at, at the edge of trying to paint, you know, um, you know, perhaps even scaring people. But I want to, want to make this point. Uh, I'm often asked about schools of tomorrow and schools of the future and all that sort of thing. I don't believe in that because I don't even know. What, I don't even know I'm going to wake up tomorrow. So I, I plan to spend a lot of time in the future, but I'm not interested in predicting it. And I'm not going to mount an argument about the change world if I didn't go through the schools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We all know. But what I do know is what we do right today will help us make be better tomorrow. And I think that's that's one of my fundamental. Uh, principles that we need to look at. Um, we can talk about technology change and all that. We can talk about assistive and the technologies. We talk about AI and predictive analytics and all those sorts of things. It's all coming. But there's, there's a, a simple fact emerging here that's come out of COVID. I believe that the central issues in COVID are not political. They're not economic. They're not economic. Um, uh, political, e economic, or medical. Those things are critically important. Uh, uh, no argument. And we're working in those. What we have discovered, however, the most important issue is social because we're all connected. Our lives depend on each other, working collab cooperatively, collaboratively, working together. So, my to challenge is what skill sets do we want our kids to have? so that they can actually work out a world that is so close we can't be an isolate in, in today's world. And COVID-29 is going to be, be as challenging as COVID-19. Mm -hmm. so, to come back to the simple proposition, the only way we can do it is to make sure kids learn, know how to learn and then relearn it, unlearn and relearn. That's it. They will, they'll have to learn the future to do it differently. And then I suspect they're not going to do it by being rooted in an experience that we've, we've talked through. Um, thank you. Sandra. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Tony, Tony, in my response to people, I want to just talk about fear a bit because what, what I think is, is stopping us here is a, um, a fear that we're going to unpick something that served us well for the last um, what, probably 50 years and that we're going to do it, as Tom said, um, as Tom indicated, he was worried that we can't test or assess reliably and credit creditably, I think you said, Tom, that we just can't assess the sorts of things we're, turning, we're talking about as the learning aspirations that we have for kids that they need to know to thrive. Um, and the fear is that what will happen is we'll have some jerry-rig system where nepotism and, um, you know, cherry-picking and inequity and all of these things rule when we've got this nice regulated system based on examinations that hold the thing together. So what I'm saying what I say to that is, of course, we can assess reliably and creditably, comparably, um, with, with reliabilities of over 0.9, with precision quite high, as high as ATAR anyway, um, these complex competencies, and that's been shown time and time again. My own centre has been working on this for 15 years. We've got the evidence that you can do it. What we need to be do, to do is be 
bold enough to take that forward and trust that we can build a better system. And my and the um, so I think at the moment it is righteous fear of me- messing up the system that's stopping us. And what? <laughs> but I'm at the point now, and you know I'm I'm a realist. I'm an I've got a psychometrics background. I, I'm not an airy fairy um, sort of idealist. I know that these things can go wrong, but I think that the problems that we've got are, are worse than the risks we have. And there are always risks to take the next steps. So I think that fear is stopping us now, and that's what I think we should try and get over. Thank you. Right. As we open this up, I just want to record that the online pre-poll did work. And I'll just let you know that the response to the question, have senior secondary high stakes examinations outlived their purpose? We had 66% saying yes, they have outlived their purpose. 18% saying no and 16% undecided. I declare that this route was in fact the reverse of that. So it's going to be fascinating to see where we land as we approach around about uh, a few minutes before six. Uh, But let me ask you this question uh, before I launch into explicit questions that have come from multiple colleagues, and I'll do that uh, on their behalf uh, online. But I'm also picking up a more significant question for each of you, I think, and that is we are not waiting for the determination of examination authorities or government to see change. So, Greg, there's already those who are determining that they will assess in other ways, and to quote quote David, um, they are complementing what they are doing now with a range of other assessments. And depending upon what pathway young people wish to take, they are using that as evidence of what they know and are able to do. They're not waiting for anybody. They are, if you like, combining the current system with additional information. Others are bypassing the system entirely. They are making judgments not at the end of year 12. They're not waiting for the end of some senior secondary school to determine whether or not they might actually choose a pathway. Others are actually enterprising and have started their own businesses. Others are making judgments that, in fact, say, I'm not interested in an ATAR at all. So, Greg, it's not as if the future is not present. It is present. So what are you saying here about this sense that we have to change? Aren't we already changing, Greg? Well, we're always in an liminal world. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. No, it's not going to, I'm not going to go to sleep uh, on Sunday night and wake up to the brave new world. It's all, all happening. It's a work in progress. I, I acknowledge that fact. Um, but I, I agree wholeheartedly with Sam that we, we've known for a long, long time that we can assess the OECD if we're yep. talking about doing this. Long time. We just don't do it. Yep. Right? Because the reasons that we've traversed here, it beggars my description. One of the things I say in my own system, I say principal says, oh, I can't do this. Well, I'm telling you, you can. Even that doesn't work. Um, we've got some great um, examples of how, how we are doing. And I come back to the COVID. One of the feedback we got from parents was outstanding. We've, the, they found out so much more about their kids because they were able to get online at times when it suited them rather to get up and do the speed dating and the, here's the marks and, and that's where you go. And have developed rich conversations. And the, the, the future, actually, when you, you look at these things, it's not the, the assessment part of it per se, but it's the learning journey. You know, what's wrong with the kids name right from their entry point at age three to the school? Their learning continuum. So you can start talking about not only the past. And all, you've been, seeing, so you've much been of, seeing that in the last four months. Yeah. yeah okay. not, not only the past, but the future. Look, that's where I, go, I need to go, yep. and this is what I need to do. All right, we I'm play, go this, to, play this game. That's a lot of it's sick. Okay, I'm going to go to the to the room first before I start picking up on some of the online responses. So I can get a microphone to people. If you can just indicate who you are, 
uh, and I'm going to take two or three uh, rather than actually do one-on-ones here. So can you please indicate if you want to come in? Okay, we're getting a microphone to the first. Let's say who you are. Keep your comment or question short. Thanks, um, thanks for the panel. My, my name is Dallas McNeil. Three really great panelists we've been treated this afternoon. My question is about an alternative form of end of school assessment, which is uh, sometimes uh, forming part of this debate. And if we move away from end of school examinations to what is broadly defined as a portfolio uh, approach uh, to uh, university methods, how do you square away the equity concerns when, if you're talking about a system which favours an individual yes. student uh, with a lot of economic and social agency, who can point to, for example, a uh, terrific Duke Vinifer Award program, time in an orphanage offshore uh, during the holidays, uh, a terrific extracurricular uh, suite of activities? Uh, charity work and others compared to that kid in punch bowl who has a desk lamp and his text, his or her textbooks um, to get them through uh, it to be assessed. Yep. Um, and how do you guard against what well, it is inevitably be a waiting in the wrong direction? Thank you. Um, further comment, question from the floor. Please wave uh, if you've got one. I just want to give uh, just a couple of rounds to the room. Uh, first, so please come in. Okay, then I just want to pick up on a number of questions around equity that have come through online as well. Each of you have mentioned it. Tom, have a first go. Look, um, couldn't agree more with Dallas. If, 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 let's say, firstly, I don't understand why we have to set up these, uh, uh, I know it's a cliche, but these dichotomies. We will have this border recognition and we will deconstruct what we have now. There's an element of truth in what Sandra says, that this is about fearing the displacement of something that's an enormous achievement of the profession so in this nation's on. Before we start eroding it, let's be clear of the detail of uh, what Sandra's saying. You're not coming for a drink after, are you? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll come. <laughs> but, but, that that is an equest, an, in, in a very simple uh, it's a simple question of the politics of reform. Yes. For thirty years, you can't survive as an administrator in this state, in this country, unless you're changing stuff. You've got to be changing stuff, right? And you declare the new thing before you know the old thing has happened today. I'm not loyal to any form. I don't care if it's an exam. I don't care if, 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 if it's a reading. What I care about is the validity and the reliability, which has as it, at its heart, which is a necessary precondition for meeting what Dallas said, which is the equitable purpose. Right. Because the commonality of the curriculum, the richness of a curriculum, is what allows a moderated uh, judgment and therefore allows the achievement of individuals on the common material rather than an assessment of an, uh, of an individual's valuable social capital. Okay. Sandra, have a go. I'll come back to Greg. Have a go. By the way, I'd love you to link uh, fear, equity, validity and reliability, please. Okay. Let me, let me start with validity and reliability, which are my staples, right? Yeah. So um, I, I actually want to bounce off the um, comment from the audience. I didn't quite hear who it was who talked about portfolio-based assessments. And I, I want to say that we are that you cannot get validity. You, what you need is validity, right, reliability, transparency, standards underpinning, comparability careful judgment, ease of use, utility, like you're not going to get all the universities going through 10,000 portfolios. What, what you need is assessment that is as simple and transparent, not maybe as an HSC certificate, that is summative, that is standards-based, all of those kinds of things. And all of that has to be true about the measures of the full range of learning. 
Now, once you've got that, and that sounds, and I'm sure to Tomsey, that sounds impossible. But um, what, possible. It, it is possible. Um, I went yesterday to the launch of the big picture international credential, which as far as I'm aware is the first uh, credential in the world, or certainly in Australia, let me not overclaim, that um, credentials at the end of year 12, based on two or three years of study, the uh, deep competencies in areas like quantitative reasoning, reasoning, empirical reasoning, communication, knowing how to learn, and does it with assessments that are reliable, comparable, standards-based, interpretable. Already 19 universities have said that they're going to accept these credentials and um, the, the kids are out there proud and strong with, with what they're giving. Now, those assessments are as reliable and as strong as the sorts of assessments that we currently have on the HSC. So um, that's that's where I, that's where I am, and, and I think that's equity, where. But the equity question, Sandra. Well, big picture started off as a school for kids who couldn't uh, couldn't work in the normal area. It the 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 equi these uh, approaches in a sense, are more equitable because the, the assessments are also able to take into account different contexts, different ways of doing. They're not based on a standard, invigilated, middle-class view of what um, mentation is all about. They're based on competence, what you can do um, regardless of your context. It's, it's got inherent equity advantages in it. Uh, and I'll, I'll, that's, anyway, there you go. How's yeah. that? <laughs> I'm going to come back to Greg. And then Tom wants to respond as well. So, Greg? Oh, just very quickly. I, my response to Dallas is that it's not a, it's somehow painted as an either or. It's not an either or. Uh, I mean, Sanders is saying the, the complexity um, that comes with a, a rethinker, a, 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 a way of, a, of knowing what young people uh, have learned. So, um, we're, we're not saying just, Go to the portfolio and everything will be all equal. Uh, it, it's the, the really it's really demanding intellectual work, and we've got to break through how we can um, actually implement. So, can, can I just be clear here, Tom, and then come uh, come in? When you say it's not either or, you said let's not pursue false dichotomies, right? When we set the question up to say that high stakes examinations mm -hmm. without with their usefulness, Greg, you're not saying that. You're saying that. I am not going to position this as an either or. If examinations can continue to contribute in ways that they can recognise learning and serve equitable purposes, but combined with other forms of assessment, other forms of recognition of learning that give a more complete picture of the learner, then you're saying, I hear, you'll go for both. Um, I wish I said that. No. <laughs> I, I agree. Um, the, and the issue is... What we need to do, we talk about the test first, but it's it's actually ultimately the understanding of what you want kids to learn and how they're going to learn. That should be the entry point, not the, not the, um, the, the task at the end. I, Tom, can I just put this to you uh, and then respond as you would have anyway? Yeah, it'll just make me feel better if I put this to you. And I want to pick up on some yeah, questions. Yeah, <laughs> from uh, from Graham and from Richard and from others, and I'll come back in a moment to... Uh, a comment that Jennifer Buckingham's made. But there's a sense here that what is this debate about? If we can continue to see the value of, by the way, some people want to redefine high stakes. They're perfectly happy to say, listen, in the assessment regime, let us have senior secondary examinations combined with other forms of assessment that give a better picture and then ultimately uh, creating utility, right, and could generate sufficient trust that all of these assessments can be used in appropriate ways to support young people in their choice, in their next stage of learning, in the pathways that they choose. So, 
Tom, where are you on this? Because the, the question coming through here, but if you don't give more space to complementary assessments and spend money on them, right, then the kind of examinations we have at the moment will continue to dominate the space. Well, let me begin from the fundamental principle. The point of assessment is to assess the extent to which the intended learning has been achieved, right? So we go from there. Examinations are a practical way of doing it. They're not the only way of doing it. They're possibly the only affordable way of doing it at the scale at which we do. Form is really a subsequent issue. But let me, let me make the debate pointed again. Sandra, I felt we were going so well. <laughs> I know big picture. I know Viv White when I was an activist. I worked mm -hmm. with her. I helped set up. We had we shared thoughts. I helped map big picture to the New South Wales curriculum. Yep. We can't simply say, we can't rely on a simple assertion that it's the same system and it's equally as reliable. It's just not. The IB is not, let alone big picture. It's not. I know it. I'm not against achieving that ambition. I'm not against expanding our idea of what is valuable. But I don't think that should be done by undermining yeah. the valuable curriculum that has lasted millenniums. I don't think the valuable curriculum that has lasted millenniums needs to exclude any additional thoughts. But I do think as a profession, we don't rely on social media statements, whatever, to assert that we have other approaches. Okay. Okay, there's two points just this thought comes in. Um, a number of people are saying it would help us in this conversation if we could more adequately define high stakes because it's being used in different ways. And a number of people are saying, listen, I would like to reconsider what we mean by high stakes. I think they're also saying I'd like to reconsider what we mean by seeing secondary assessments and how important they are at a particular moment uh, given a range of other developments that are occurring. The other thing comes from Jennifer Buckman where she says, examinations serve a specific purpose. They allow students to demonstrate that they've acquired the knowledge and skills that comprise the discipline or learning area. They have studied. Well-constructed examinations do this well. But goes on to say, nobody, I think, is arguing that these examinations would provide a full picture of everything that a student knows and can do. Absolutely right. Nobody's actually arguing that. But in the absence, of valuing other forms of assessment, creating space for them, and putting the investment in, which is your point, Tom, yeah, putting the investment in, and you've been putting that investment in, Santa. By the way, internationally, let's just make it clear, there's huge investment in the space. The question is to what extent we're harnessing that to seriously look at ways in which we can do better at the senior secondary level. And that's then a question I'm coming back to fear potentially, and the politics of education. Phil? Uh, another uh, point here I want to make, throw in, uh, and I think it's the elephant in the room. This is a, we have a national, actually international, but we have a national audience here, and I might, I might Paul Martin's far enough away not to keep me in the ankles, Alan de Glade's a long way away, uh, and any other CEO of uh, authority across this country. I, how many have we got now? Eight? Did eight different certificates? We have certainly got eight states. I'm not sure that eight certificates, but something close to that. We've got the best part. Bureaucracy. Tom's question about where's the money coming from, that's a classic one. Gosh, you know, if you added up all the money that is expended across the country in running these shows, um, there'd be an over and abundance of money to do the kind of things Sandra say. Well, Sandra, let me come to you on that very point, uh, because we know that it will take dedicated resources. Uh, you are you are yourself investing in this, right? Uh, and you're partnering with many other agencies internationally to advance this work. Do you think that we're now building adequate resources and investment in order to accelerate what in your terms would become a, 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 a more adequate recognition system of learning with the dimensions that you've identified, namely utility, trust, transparency. How far off are we? Oh, Tony, I, <clears throat> I, I think we're a fair way off. 
Um, and, you know, I think it would take a couple of, honestly, if I'm honest, a couple of years to sort of get our act together. I, funnily Greg's enough... Greg's been waiting for 40 years for a change. A couple I know, of years. I know. Yeah, but, but I t- I'll tell you what, I, this is why my sense of urgency here is really important because students are wa- uh, 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 walking away from the ATAR. I read something that was in the press, so it might not be right, but I think it was, that in Western Australia in the last five years, if Alan Blagage is, is there, he'll be able to confirm this or not, um, there are 10% fewer kids now who are applying for the ATAR. They're, they're voting with their feet Yep. away from it. Yep. Universities are voting with their feet to get more and more people in not via the ATAR. My main concern is if the authority, these eight things that Phil was talking about, does do not act now, we will have lost the opportunity and we're just going to have a fragmented, inequitous mess on our hands. I want the Toms of the world to be in there swinging and now is the time and we've got a couple of years to do it. Hold on, Mr. Tom comes back in. There are a couple of other questions here that go to this very point, namely that if we don't act now, the question about equity could become even more problematic because there's plenty of people using alternative forms of assessment, right, and they're negotiating their way, but often they're young people already with a fair bit of capital. Mm. So actually, the, the, uh, there's a mention here about digital credentials, right? Already kids are accessing micro-credentials, bypassing the system, but they know what credentials they need, they know how to bypass the system, and they know how to go for direct entry. So in other words, the equity question could easily be made worse than Yes, and and what I really think we need nationally is to say, as we have done in in other places, this is what we want our kids to learn. This is what we want them to know and to be able to do. And we will take responsibility for for um, warranting the degree to which each individual is able to do that. And don't leave it to sort of. Um, you know, micro-credentials from this organisation and that organisation which purports to say something about what kids know and can do. Well, Sandra, I want to say this to Tom because there's another couple of things come in. But can I say, by the way, we have said what we value. We do actually have had, we have had four declarations, right, that have actually said something about this. When you and I were on ACARA and we got to year 10 and we then said let's tackle senior secondary, we were told no. And, David, you might want to come in. David's in the room. I can't quite see where you are, right? And you might want to say something about this because we had a, a, an opportunity to push on into 11 and 12, and at that point we were not able to do that. So what's your sense about the momentum here? Have we got a chance? Well, look, I, the, 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 the thing that Sam said that I most agree with is I have fear because of equity purposes of fragmentation right. that's accelerating. Yep. That's why it was seven years ago that I instituted a trial of portable electronic portfolios for students. Yep. They were complementary to part of the accreditation. As I say, it fell down through lack of resources. My point about the money was about introducing new technologies. You dedicate another couple of days to the whole federalist uh, effectiveness overlapping with lots of issue. Nice try, Phil. Uh, but, you know, that's a whole other debate. Um, the, I don't want the premise of the discussion to be that we're not currently identifying an enormous amount of what is bad. Let's not forget most of the courses in the HSC are vacational courses. We do something like 30 or 40 languages. Yep. So there's a margin. That doesn't mean we should rest on that level. Yep. But I'm not convinced. I don't think it's accepted. It wasn't my point that we can do it as well if we spend as much money. I think everything is possible with enough investment. Yep. And if you want the HSC or the equivalent to cost, um, you know, five hundred million instead of a uh, hundred million, you can probably do it now. Actually, right. moderate those judgments, yep. etc. So a lot of it is value. There are things that we want to expand as to what we capture formally from schooling in order to avoid the fragmentation. Like, uh, yep. Yep. 
differently. Yeah. And then we have to do that on the basis of first principles. What are those things? How do we assess them validly? It, it's in a way quite simple, but we're making it complex by building in assumptions that we're not doing it adequately already. We need to change what we're doing, et cetera. Okay. And coming on this, Greg, and by the way, Julia's saying here, it would really help in the both and part of this conversation if we reduce the weighting that we gave to senior secondary examinations in the way in which we think about ultimately their use. Now, we could have an entire debate about that. Reduce the weight of the eight. Say again? Reduce the weight of the eight. It doesn't have to be on the basis of 10 units. It could be just as reliable on six units. You still do 10 units for your HSC, only six of them count towards your ACA. You've got four units to study. And that would create space. To study Catalonia or something. Got it. Greg? Um, this will surprise some people, but I agree with Jennifer Buckingham about the, 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 the testing part. But the, the problem is, though, how is it implemented? You go into a room, sit down, and a pen and paper on, on essays, and we've already heard what, what happens in the lead-up to that, guessing the, guessing the question. So uh, it, 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 does, it actually speaks against uh, the, the problem, uh, the, this construct that uh, Jennifer outlined. But... Coming back to another way of approaching this, right? we have examples, they're, they're, they're global now, where you can now negotiate. Yep. Right? Now, um, you can do diplomas, you can do um, certain um, cert, um, things. Apprenticeships, cert, licenses. Apprenticeships and licenses. Do it part-time, when you want it, where yep. you want it, yep. and get you know, uh, three-course credential for first year university, while others are coming up this um, agency. And that's what's happening Globally in, 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 in the world. Now, I'm not saying it's easy to do or it's complex, but we ignore the reality of our peril because I want schools to continue. They are so important to society, social glue. But, you know, people are stealing away. And you have a look at the attendance figures across Australia on any one day, and sometimes they frighten the daylights out here because, you know, you're sometimes in the 50s and 60% just attendance is... What is that telling us? Got it. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back to the room. Uh, are there others who are going to come in? Uh, can you wave uh, and indicate that you want to make a contribution? Uh, David, I'm going to put you on the spot uh, because, yeah, if we can get a microphone there, because you and I had an exchange just the other day, uh, precisely, I think, um, on the point about how you think about not alternatives, right, but how you think about complementarity. And, and, and I thought you were arguing, yeah, let's incentivise alternative ways of assessing. No, let's, uh, let's incentivise complementary ways. Complementary, yeah. Complementary, I think, it goes to the issue of um, false dichotomies. Uh, what the HSC assesses is what the HSC assesses. It doesn't assess a whole range of uh, and so the idea of having uh, a complementary form of assessment that tries to capture other aspects of a person's life is a good idea. There are a whole range of, of problems with it, though, and Sandra's has pointed to them already. Uh, and this is around how you get rigor and credibility uh, into such a system so that it doesn't end up uh, counterproductive in terms of equity. You, yep. point, if you, you put your finger on that tiny yep. Uh, yeah. The other, the only other thing that I guess I would, um, you know, express a note of caution about is, and um, I'm not sure if Sandra would agree with me. I'm just wary about wanting to measure and capture and assess everything. Um, uh, uh, we, schooling should be data informed, not data driven. Um, what is the actual infrastructure of the data collection that we have to create? In order to measure how uh, whether a student is how collaborative are they, uh, what is the what is the extent of their intercultural capability, what is the extent of their ethical understanding? Yeah, these kinds of things I think need to be carefully considered before we we um, think about how much data we really want to collect um, in order to capture these things. Which, in the grand scheme of things, education is um, not necessarily we might be able to capture them in data should. Um, David, could you pass the microphone to Paul? <laughs> so this is too good an opportunity. 
right? Uh, Paul, and, and the reason why I feel this is that we've got a lot of people who have been following the way in which New South Wales has picked up on the Masters report, yep? And here you are at this point in time as NESA asking yourself serious questions about how you're going to take forward those recommendations. And here we are at a moment in time where those very recommendations would take us into the territory of the both and, potentially, right, in quite significant ways. Now, I don't want to try and argue here now that we can settle any of that, but what's your observation about the direction of this conversation? Do you think that there is, to go to Phil's point, not only some energy here in New South Wales, but around a country, particularly when you get a packer agencies together to say, yeah, we are worried about time. We might actually miss the opportunity and get greater fragmentation. So we better actually take this moment when the forces are in play. Give us a sense of how you're feeling about that. I'm not going to answer that question at all. I'm going to answer a different question, one that I've asked myself as I've been sitting here. No, no, look, I was at an ACACA meeting today where we were concerned for most of the two and a half hours yep. about the alternative means by which universities were attracting students prior to the HSC. Mm. We weren't concerned because the universities were finding better means of attracting students. We were concerned because the universities are taking away the, um, the credibility of the whole schooling process <coughs> and you know, senior secondary uh, content and, and information and also the credential yep. in order to fulfil a competitive advantage against each other. Some of them are uh, uh, universities that are attracting students on the basis of their sandstone uh, status. Others are attempting to uh, attract students into fill seats so that they can get as many students in as possible. Their concern, from my perspective and the perspective of my CAC colleagues, was not that they were after the best way of attracting students. It was as many students as we can attract. So there's a concern to decide. In relation to the whole debate, and I, I will go back to Tom's point about being an activist versus a policymaker. I'm not being critical, Greg, but the short form of the tweet that says the HSC is out of its usefulness doesn't do me a lot of good in NESA in proposing alternatives to the HSC. What I have to do is something that's valid and reliable and transparent and fair, and that does not exacerbate equity issues that already exist. When someone presents me with uh, Sandra's uh, alternative assessments, I'm happy to put them into place. Can I finish with one last thing? Yeah. The current HSC exams are not simply the regurgitation of facts. There is enormous intent uh, and uh, what I call critical thinking in being able to apply abstract uh, logic in a mathematics exam. There is enormous capacity, knowledge, and application in a history essay, an English essay, in a piece of art. Not only is the exam testing uh, things that are very important for students, but the 50% of school-based assessment does a whole range of the things that people have been talking about as other forms of assessment. Yeah. When, when Sandra can give me a better assessment, I'm happy to put one into place, but at the moment I'm not going to roll the dice on the, on the futures of all those kids with something that is currently a series of tweets. Thank you, Paul. Fantastic. Uh, let me... Let me bring you to a final contribution from each of you. Um, there's, by the way, a number of comments all to say, listen, have a good look at the way in which we have been shifting our assessment practices around examinations, right? So there's a real sense in which we have not recognised a number of the shifts that have actually taken place. But I want to bring you back to this point and ask you each to make a comment before we put the whole question again. Uh, and it's this, you've each referred to this being a moment in time. And you've each said, listen, this is about learning. You opened with this Tom, And it's about the recognition of the learning that we value. And the purposes of learning, right, and the ambition of learning, we are clearer about, given all of the conversation we've been having here, and internationally. So in order to overcome the fear that we've identified, but to make sure that we take the opportunity in the time frame we have so that other things don't roll over the top of us 
And in the end, we're going to find that it won't be fair. It'll be higher levels of inequity. Yep. Which is exactly, I think, the point that you are making, Paul. What would you do now to advance this debate in the best interests of validity, reliability, but better still, I think, the language standard of the news, utility, and I take it, uh, you're also saying trust. What would you do at this moment in time? Because otherwise there's a fear, I'm hearing, that we'll miss the opportunity. So I'm going to ask you, Greg, to say now, what would you do, right, in order to make sure that we can take this in the direction that you want to take it? Okay. Um, the first of all, um, going back to Paul's comment, I'll send you the thousand words that didn't get, make it on the Twitter. <laughs> no, no, no. no that, that's, that's how we ended up here. So thanks very much. I don't take it personally at all. I'll just get you later. Uh, um, how I do but to answer your question, the only way I know how to do it is to start with the individual learning spaces and the people who do the work. They're the ones who are going to find the answers to this. We can come up with, with administrators and all this sort of and policy makers. Um, that's going to perhaps help and, and help with the range of the issues that we've talked about here. Yep. There are many voices in it, but what gives me heart, and I'm extremely positive and upbeat about the future, I think the future is never brighter uh, for our schools. It just raised, it might seem funny from what I, what I, some of the things I said, but the, the concentration has to be learning from the practitioners. Right? In any, any other profession, you want to be a, a, a surgeon, you, work, you learn from your, your colleague practitioners. You don't have a policy government giving you a policy that this is the way you'll do a heart transplant. So that takes a degree of maturity, I think, for um, people like the, the, in this room to yep. sort of come to, to let go yes. and, and then find those examples and then grow them. That's how we're trying to approach it in Parramatta. Um, we've, raised, we've raised the issues, um, we get the dialogue going, and then we're finding some of those examples. Like, like so profession-led. Well, it, it, no, it's not an either. It's not a profession that we're all responsible. I, I'm, one of the things we try and do is say everybody's responsible in this. Right. So every voice, in a sense, is important because we do need people like Sandra and Paul and yourself, Tom, who um, who actually will critique it and bring that perspective to it. Yeah. But what's missing for me is the, the what's going on in the classroom. We you might be surprised to see what some of them are doing and subverting even the no, we're all totally compliant, Paul. Right. <laughs> totally compliant. Thank so, you. Please. Okay, Tom. Firstly, I, I guess I'd say let's spend more of our professional energies in recognising the technical achievement that the profession carries in the uh, activities that we do undertake extremely well now. Uh, we need to stop uh, drawing attention to vague relative other achievements, international, out of context issues, because that this is, as we said about the time, of international standing, it's recognised around the world. But more than that, at the heart of it is teachers making judgments about student work against depths of learning. Recognise that as a starting point. Then begin to say, well, what is this other stuff and how do we define it so that it is it is, in fact, definable and containable and then work towards achieving the sorts of measures that we're talking about and see if the conventional process we have can be expanded, uh, even not within the same standards, that is, the specificity leads to an ATAR. It doesn't have to be, uh, to be that, but that it is credible. It's comparable and credible in the same way that uh, Sandra has described. But to do that, my overarching point, which I dropped out of my notes at the beginning when I realised I had been, uh, uh, is rather twenty is that we turn have to turn our professional culture into one of moderation, professional moderation. That is comparing judgments, yep. and away from the way we can entice into online culture wars. Sandra, I'm going to uh, ask you to wrap up. I'm going to just say, as you do, um, it, it shouldn't escape our attention that this is being convened by the Australian College of Education. There is a real sense in which. Uh, there is, and I'm, I'm not stealing your thunder here by saying, look, um, 
we as educators do want to take responsibility in exactly the way that you're talking about, both of you, yes, for how we think about promoting and recognising learning that's in the interest of all young people. Uh, we have a national project of significance at the moment that Sandra referred to, Learning Creates Australia, that's attempting to do exactly that with all of those people who are partners in this room. So, Sandra, you said earlier um, it'll take a couple of years, and then you said, I fear that the time might escape us. So what's your sense of what has got to happen if, and I'm not trying to get false consensus here, but I think most of us are saying, let us be more adequate in the way in which we go about the assessment of young people's learning so that it supports them in their future learning and their pathways so they can be successful. So let's say we've got a couple of years. What are we going to do? Uh, you're on. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Tony, as you know, I think about this all the time. What what can we do? And um, I'm with Greg in thinking that the answer is in the schools because um, the vast majority of principals know what their kids do, know what they need to know. The, the approach that we've been taking in our centre is to, we're working with around about 80 schools at the moment in various ways, shapes and forms, all of whom I call first movers because they've decided not to wait for their local authority. They've decided to get into the weeds and say, how would we do this? And they're talking about things like teacher workload and professional learning and comparability and um, all of those sorts of things. They're getting down and dirty about what it would take. What I would like to see is the curriculum authorities standing behind these people, watching what they're doing and start facilitating what they're doing because this cannot be solved in the st academic stacks of a library or in the conference rooms of policy people. It's got to be solved on the ground with the schools that know what they're doing and we've got a whole bunch who are keen to do it and I think okay. we should be with them. Right. Now, look, at, thank you. This is a moment where, in fact, asking you to reconsider the question, right, is not respectful of the conversation we've had because the question itself has assumptions attached to it that we have challenged. But nonetheless, just out of interest, <laughs> just out of interest, we're going to put the question again. Uh, online, we will be able to gather the responses. In this room, I'm going to ask you to once again indicate by a show of hands. So let me remind you that the question is, have senior secondary high stakes examinations outlived their purpose. So, Helen, we're putting that question, right, for the post-conversation to see whether or not we get a shift in the vote. And in this room, can I ask you to indicate your view? Having had this conversation, have senior secondary high-stakes examinations outlived their purpose? Those who are saying yes, could you please indicate? Those that are saying no, can you please indicate? And those who are undecided, this room remains steadfast. <laughs> uh, okay, on balance, they have not outlived their usefulness, and I would have thought that this debate is saying yes, depending on how we define the nature of their use, the extent of their use, and in combination with what. That is a very interesting question. Okay. Do we get a readout, Helen, very quickly from the field? We do. Can you tell me whether you've got that readout already? And can you get a microphone, please, so that you can share that with us? Do we have a shift in the online community? Oh, and now use your microphone if you if you can. Oh, that you. Sorry, my my apologies. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> the online community remains steadfast, <laughs> namely that, in fact, 67% uh, say yes, it's outlived their We're usefulness. Hey, <laughs> never 16% uh, <laughs> and not convinced 18%. <laughs> so we've got actually a bit of a shift in the categories. 
But that is absolutely brilliant that what you have done, all three of you, is brilliantly reinforced the bias that people brought into the room <laughs> at the start. It is, uh, that is confirmation bias. I was going to make the topics. <laughs> Phil. Oh. No, I know, but I was going to get, I was going to, Phil, I was going to get Phil to introduce you, Phil. Uh, so you can do that for yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to repeat anything that's been said, but I just want to begin with, wow, and oh, my goodness. I think educators and the educational community and those that are impacted are just hungry for these types of forums and discussions and debates, and I think it's just wonderful. Today has been exceptionally powerful. It's been deep. It's been diverse. We've established it's not been persuasive, though, but... <laughs> But it's just providing greater agency and greater voice for our education community and, and that that we build upon. So I'm going to repeat it. Wow, and oh, my goodness. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lila Malachik and I am the Vice President of the Australian College of Educators. And this afternoon I have the enviable task of thanking our incredible debaters and our hosts. As educators, we are so used to working in challenging and complex environments. Issues that appear, at least on the surface, to be simple and straightforward can ignite much passion, and we have seen that, in diverging positions, and we have seen that, not only from within our profession, but from those external to it. And a good example of that, and I actually don't want to repeat that question now, I have seen the secondary high stakes examinations out with their purpose because I think we could reforge that as well and still come out with the same results, by the way. On behalf of the Australian College of Educators, I would like to thank our incredible panel members and debaters for this afternoon. In the first of the college new courting controversy series, and this event, Jude Tony a bit too, has now set the tone for further discourse and debate on other events. So, Tom Eleganaris, Greg Whitby and Sandra Milligan, thank you for agreeing to participate, to be vulnerable, to be forceful, to be informed in this wonderful and amazing event and bringing your absolute A game to execute your positions with style, passion and a home. Well done. Please, everybody, can you join me in thanking our speakers? <laughs> now, of course, we'd like to thank Jeff Newcomb and the amazing AIS New South Wales team for supporting and hosting the event today. As always, because I have been at a number of them, it's been exceptional. And, of course, we must thank our vibrant and talented moderator, Tony McKay, for his exceptional and expert management of today's debate. Often he's been provocative and his comments have reforged the tone at any given moment throughout the session. And I look forward to further events in this sense. And I really like the way that you altered the time frames, caught everyone off guard. Wow. I would so look forward to doing that as a panellist. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank everyone who took the time to join us and participate. It's been exceptionally lively and a very passionate discussion, debate, to say the least. And before we formally close off proceedings for this, this evening, I have the pleasure of providing the teaser for the next courting controversy event. And the theme for the next debate is, can anyone do a drum roll? Just oh, I love our community of educators. Thank you. And it is the dynamic interplay between the future of education and the future of work. And I think that'll be exceptional. But may I just say, Tony, I don't know if you agree with this, but to ensure an even playing field, and I don't want to be controversial here, but we might have to have a dress code for below the knees for the next panel. Yeah. Okay? Yeah? yeah. Yeah, with me on that? Thank yeah, you. absolutely. So please, everyone, keep your eye on the college's social media over the coming months to see what the question is going to be that's put forward and for the next round of great debaters and who they will be, perhaps it could be you. So until we next court controversy, thank you, everyone, and enjoy your evening. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Yeah.